Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Judy Singer. I'm the Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity. And I want to welcome you to this session on helpful guidance for effective faculty searches. And uh, I just want to make a few framing remarks and briefly introduce our panelists and then uh, turn it over. Uh, in thinking about this session, I was reminded of the first search committee that I was on. Um, I was an untenured uh, associate professor. And I was caught in the power politics of a group of people where I could see what was going on and I knew I dare not speak. Uh, that it was a very complex uh, situation. Uh, that's actually not the right response. And so part of what I'm hoping we will learn today is how to help faculty, whether they are tenure track faculty or tenured faculty or non ladder faculty, all feel like they have something to contribute to the process. Because I think that as we think about building a stronger and better and more diverse faculty, we need a range of voices uh, who do feel comfortable speaking and thinking about how we can hear from different people who have perspectives that are important to share. And obviously, consensus has to be reached, decisions need to be made, but listening to one another is actually one of the most important things that I think happens in a faculty search. Uh, the number of searches at the university right now is not that high. Now, some of that's tied to the endowment returns, but some of it's actually tied to the move to a tenure track. Uh, one of the handouts you have at your seat is the rise in the fraction of the Harvard faculty that's tenured. And that is a consequence of a move for a tenure track, but what it says is each search should be treated like your firstborn child. Uh, it's the most important thing we do in terms of who we hire and how we mentor them when they're here. And as we think about building a faculty of the future uh, in a room where there are mostly dead white men on the wall, that's the old Harvard faculty, uh, we want to think about having a faculty that is much more diverse, pulls talent from a variety of sources, and brings people to our community who can push their research forward, uh, bring intellectual diversity to our community, and also uh, teach our students about new ideas and new ways of thinking. So uh, I thank you all for taking the time to come out. I thank our panelists, who I will briefly introduce by explaining why they were selected. They actually don't know this. Um, so you have their bios uh, sitting there. Uh, over on my far right is Eris Bonnet, who is a professor uh, at the Kennedy School uh, and is also a former academic dean of the Kennedy School and has had a fantastic book come out on gender uh, by design in the workplace. And uh, she will be our moderator. Next to Iris is Mazarin Banaji, who is a professor of psychology uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and is also the senior advisor to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences on faculty development and diversity. Uh, her book on implicit bias called Blind Spot with her collab longtime collaborator, Tony Greenworld, is well worth reading. Uh, Meredith Rosenthal is next. She is a professor of health economics at the School of Public Health and is also the associate dean for diversity. And and then we have James Simpson, who is the tallest person on the panel and asked for the <laughs> shortest introduction. Uh, <laughs> James is a professor at the chair of the English department in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we pulled together this panel because collectively they have a wealth of wisdom and different perspectives on the faculty search process, both from being a department chair, from being a dean who's thinking about diversity issues, from having been an academic dean and somebody who thinks about how organizations can make better decisions and open up uh, opportunities to women and also by extension uh, to minorities. So it's a group of people who have thought a lot about these topics. They represent a range of schools here. And I, for one, am looking very much forward to ideas that they have as we think about moving forward with our faculty searches uh, this year and in the future. So I will turn it over to Iris. Thank you very much, um, Judy, um, and thank you for the leadership of your office and your team um, on this uh, very important topic. So I thought I would start uh, by making three remarks. And they all have something to do with the time that we're in. So first, uh, I think if vice presidential candidates talk about unconscious bias in the debate, 
we do know that something is happening. Of course, because of the work of Mazarin and others. Um, so you see, I kind of believe in small sample sizes. Um, but anyway, so that was kind of, kind of remarkable. I don't think they dealt with it perfectly. Um, but it is remarkable how it has become kind of part of a general discussion. I'm also encouraged by kind of a number of new technology developments, software, startups, which have taken the insights to heart and made it easier for all of us to improve our search processes, our hiring processes. And I thought I'll just give you kind of a few examples. I'm teaching a course right now on behavioral economics for organizations where I have a number of them in my class. And they vary from, you know, one company is called Edge. They help organizations self-evaluate, just measure how well they do in terms of diversity. Another one is called Pymetrics, which has developed unbiased, they claim, but unbiased tests to help uh, employers to evaluate job candidates more objectively and also to source more broadly. And then we had Fidelity, and um, was actually very interesting, we have Fidelity in the room as well, who's using um, this software and shared with us that it increased the fraction of female candidates um, for Fidelity from 30% to about 50%. Because the tests now allow them to look much more broadly than they ever have, just um, focusing on CVs. And then finally, another service is called Applied, they help organizations do blind evaluation, so blind themselves to demographic characteristics of job applicants. And the UK government, some of you might have been noticing, the UK government just announced that they move for the whole civil service in the UK, move to blind evaluations, where they blind themselves to demographic characteristics and also the address of job applicants. So a lot is happening um, that um, you know, makes me quite optimistic, actually. I thought I'll end with a um, uh, personal experience. So I recently applied these insights to my own search. So I hired a new assistant, and we changed our evaluation process. And we did um, three things. So first of all, we blinded ourselves to people's demographic characteristics, including to the schools that people went to. Um, that was actually the most disconcerting part for me, because I really don't care about gender, race, ethnicity, anything else. But not knowing where somebody went to school was like, hmm, OK. So we, evalu we uh, evaluated the CVs, then put them aside. And then we had everyone take a work sample test. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what I really need in an assistant, what I look for. Uh, so for example, one of the um, work exercises was a scheduling task. And we evaluated those performances, not knowing, of course, how they compare to people's CVs. So we didn't know everyone had a number, so we didn't know, know um, uh, the correlation between CV and work performance. And then I did a structured interview, again, not knowing people's CVs or not recalling people's CVs or knowing their scores for their work sample tests. So we kind of tried to get at three independent observations uh, of the different candidates. And then in the end, we pulled it all. And we had different, of course, different evaluators. And then we, we hired somebody. And I think it was, it was a super interesting exercise for my whole team and for myself. Um, because we, we all noticed that in this one-on-one -on -one interview, you know, it's so hard not to be biased. I mean, people will share, even, even in a structured interview, which is much better than a non-structured interview, but even in a structured interview, people will share all kinds of things with you, and you're just like, yeah, you know, hmm, it's really me, yeah. Um, so we weigh the work sample test very, very highly. So again, this is sample size of one. This is not my research. I normally have um, bigger samples. Um, but I thought I'd share the experience with you just to recommend that sometimes it's also just good to experiment with something for you, to try something out. And see um, what impact it really has on your own evaluations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists who will um, tell us a bit more about their work, um, both their research, but also their practical work in faculty searches and hiring. <coughs> Thank you, Iris. Thank you um, all for being here. Um, I thought I was the only one who noticed that the presidential debate and the vice presidential debates mentioned um, work on, on implicit bias, but I'll just read you the tweet from one presidential candidate that went out uh, yesterday, and you'll tell me which one of the two presidential candidates tweeted this. Implicit bias is real. It hurts Americans. Anybody who'd outright deny its existence is unfit for the White House. Um, now, the reason I bring this up uh, is not to have a discussion about which political candidate said it or which one is the one we should all vote for, but rather um, that 
to me, this is the moment in which I can be tough with you all. And the, re and the reason I say that is because 25 years ago, when this work first began to be done, um, people would speak about it in hushed tones. Uh, people would say, do you realize, I mean, this might be going on, the work is suggesting this, letters of recommendation are not using the words in, in the same ways, and, and so on. And I just think that when presidential candidates are being asked this as a question about what is your position on this, I think the time for courage is past. It is no longer for us to say, hmm, we are not going to be ahead if we do it now. It is now going to be imperative that we simply listen to the data and then the data are not telling us what to do. They're telling us the problem. That's what it means to be in a place like Harvard where we need to sit down and decide what do we want to do about it. That's not anybody else's concern and definitely not the scientist's concern. You do not want a bunch of scientists who discovered what implicit bias is to be the ones telling you all how it should be fixed. That would be too narrow a group of people to make that decision. That decision is for anybody in a community, however we want to specify what that community is. And I think the FAS at Harvard is a reasonable such unit to undertake this kind of conversation about what we want to do. So I thought today's job was to focus in on just a small piece of all of this. And that's what we've been doing in little groups like this. Whenever we meet together, we go after one small piece of this because it's everywhere. And today it is to think about senior searches, and um, senior searches come in two forms. Uh, we promote people from within, we hire people uh, from the outside. And so some of what I will say will apply more to one or the other, but I just want to focus on two very simple stages of errors. And the first error, I think, is that we are not capable of thinking about the best people. Our minds simply don't go there. Junior searches give us a little bit of protection because there is such a thing called an ad and lots of people apply who we don't even know and our job is to go through all of those applications and read them and they believe it's their job to apply. And even for junior searches, as I reported last year in such a meeting, we're finding that the best junior faculty are not applying for our positions. And when we called them up once with Judy's permission and said, why did you not apply for our position given that you're in the top 5% of, of your field, they would say things like, well, I didn't think I was good enough for Harvard. And I brought this up the last time to argue that just because it's a junior uh, position, don't assume that the best people are actually applying. One of them even said, your advertisement said seeking exceptional candidates, and I don't think of myself as exceptional. So I want you to know that that's happening at the junior end. So at the senior end, where most people think it's not even appropriate for them to come to us and say, how about me, how about me? It's much more our job to be able to think really hard. And that I don't think happens when we're taking a shower. That's not where the good ideas come, uh, when you have to think about who are these candidates, because of a simple bias that Danny Kahneman nailed for us 50 times uh, or more in many different papers, and that is availability. The availability bias is powerful. The frequency of things, uh, our frequency of, of the expectation of things is affected by the ease with which information comes into our mind. And the ease with which information comes into our mind is what we are surrounded by. This is why we vastly overestimate the presence of certain things over others um, and underestimate the, the, the existence of other things. So we need to uh, decide on how we're going to even get what that, what's the playing field? Who are the people? And I don't think that can be done by just each of us coming up. And I'll give you my own example of this bias, which I showed not too long ago. I was on a committee. Uh, this is a tiny, elite little scientific society. There are about 400 people in it. And every year, we give an award to the person who is most deserving, somebody quite senior. And so three of us were on that committee. I was the chair of the committee, and we're all busy people. So I said to my two other committee members, you think about the best people. I'll think about the best people. We'll have a phone call. We did that. We got on the phone, and we each generated three names. And we had nine in total. Interesting. We didn't even think about the same people, which is, which is great. Some diversity. There were nine candidates before us. And as we were chatting about them, it struck me that I, who should know about this, didn't think to say, here is the list of the 400 members. How hard is it to go from A through Z and just look at the entire set of people? Okay? So I'll, you, you guess what the bias was. I'll tell you. I was from Harvard. The other person was from uh, Rutgers. And the third person was from NYU. Okay? The, the, the three of us who were the selectors were those people. So what was the bias? East Coast. East Coast. Nine names, all fantastic people, all between Boston and Washington. 
And so we picked the list up and we went from A through Z. And eventually we gave the award to somebody in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. So I, I just bring this up because it is definitely not, it's not a bias in that I'm looking at somebody and saying, she ain't good enough for us. We are not even coming up with the name. So we need to do something and maybe we'll talk about how we might figure out ways uh, to put people before, before us in some way. And I don't think any group of the kind that Iris mentioned can do that part of the work for us. They're just, I don't know that they're, th that they would have the relevant knowledge to be able to, but maybe they do. And maybe this is my elitism and thinking, what can some, group do for us, only we can do this for ourselves, but, but maybe they can. So I'd love to think about other ways in which we can be uh, prodded. The second bias, and this is the, 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 you know, one of the two, these are just the two things I want to say. So the first is not, not knowing who's out there and even bringing before us the most appropriate people. And then the second is that they come before us, and this is where the research is really strong. There is not one or five or 50 studies, but 500 of them. If you open up the database, it can be 5,000 studies that show that you can put two pieces of work in front of us that's identical with a name difference, and we will not evaluate the work equally. This is no longer a question, does it happen, does it not? It happens on everything. It happens on what uh, Iris mentioned, the name of the university can be enough. This happens for publications. If you send your paper out for publication with your institutional affiliation or no institutional affiliation, you will get quite different outcomes of whether the paper is deemed worthy enough to be published. So everybody in this room should put their affiliation on. <laughs> um, the other part of, so there are many studies now and they involve fairly shocking data and we can set that aside by saying but that's jobs in New York City where people are, you know, it's for who to hire for this yogurt manufacturing place and so what does it say about me? And that's the interesting thing, that the studies have been done on people like ourselves, right? So the study that Joe Handelsman at Yale did was on people very much like myself, people in the life sciences who run labs and who need a lab manager. And it's for the position of lab manager, and I should just tell those of you who are not in the life sciences, that the job of lab manager is actually quite crucial. If you finish college and you get the job of a lab manager, you are much more likely to get to a really good graduate program. Okay? That two years of experience running somebody's lab is worth a lot more than other things on your resume. So that's an important position. And she discovered that people like me are much more likely to hire men rather than women who are equally qualified for the job of lab manager. But not only that, we actually look at that resume and we see in it. We see, we look at the same words, the same publications, the same everything, and we say, that's so competent. What to do about that is a very deep question. Because, you know, if I, if I took somebody schlocky and said, oh, they're great, that's one thing, but here are, I'm looking at two people who are equal and one of them just looks to me so much more deserving. And we know it's deserving because we apparently give $4,000 more in salary, starting salary, to, to one over the other candidate. Even if they don't want it, we say, please take my money. You deserve $4,000 more. I will mentor you X hours more every month. These are things coming out. It's just welling up inside us. And men and women do this equally. Okay. So no place for finger pointing in this business because we are absolutely all doing it. I just saw something on solo status women. If you have a search on which there is one woman, the likelihood of hiring a woman goes down. Okay. So solo status women have a very difficult time agreeing to hire another woman. And this is something, and as the number of women in a group grows, the number of other women who are hired. And this is paradoxical and even, even ironical because it's when there are fewer women that you need more, not when there already are enough. So, so those are the kinds of things I want to bring up because now it's about the, the, the reflection on the work uh, itself. So I've been very impressed, as Iris has, by corporations. So in the last 20 years, universities have not budged much because I think we think we're not the biased ones. But Goldman Sachs and people who are in the business of just making money, they're changing very much faster than we are. So there is one company that I particularly admire. Um, it's a very large company. It's a Fortune 20. It says that its products are used by 4 billion people in the world. And 
Its CEO had heard me talk about blind auditioning and decided that he would use it in some way uh, because you can't, most of us can't use blind auditioning. I mean, we just cannot do that for our searches. Uh, even from the, from the, from the, from the get-go, it's much, much harder for us, uh, unlike symphony orchestras. And so what he did was something very intriguing. He created blind biographies of the top 100 leaders in his corporation for succession planning purposes. And he gave those to those who were to be the decision makers. And he had them read those blind biographies and rate them and came up from that set with the top 10 people. Okay. And then he did the usual thing, what we all do. You sit and talk about who are the best people to lead us, uh, where are we gonna find them, and how, you know, what, what, what does the world need right now, and what are we doing, and how should we change? You go off on a retreat, and you eat high-fat food, and you think some more, and you talk again, and then you say, who? And he did that, and he came up with the top 10. And the reason he called me up was to tell me that those two lists are mutually exclusive. That the people his own leaders selected when they knew who the candidates were, were quite different than the ones they selected. when. So I, I think that now, I'm not gonna argue that the pe people they came up with on the blind list are clearly superior to the ones that they came up with in any other way. But what it does is, that group of people now, I would consider aware. They, I think, are now less likely to make a mistake because when they now deliberate, they have to confront the fact that they did not choose the same people when they knew who they were. And that, I think, might be something that we can force uh, ourselves uh, to do uh, a little bit. So in, 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 con in closing, I think we should do seminars on, senior, on, on the work of senior people long before we even invite them out. That is, our departments should have meetings where we just read the work with no intention of hiring that person, but about just reading the work. You can have uh, four papers of each person circulated. You can discuss two people at a time. Yes, this is investment. Some of our departments do this kind of thing all the time. Mathematics is a good place to look at. They do this. They, they review people all the time, all year round. They just keep doing that. They don't wait for a search. And I think that's actually very, very good practice. Um, I think we have to be careful about how we read letters of recommendation. That's a whole other topic, and we can, we can speak um, about that. And then don't assume, when you think about a senior person, that this person is not going to come. I have one wonderful example of a person at Harvard who we tried to hire, not in my department, but in another department, maybe five years ago, then three years ago. Uh, and she said, no, absolutely no, and no again, you know, each time. We asked, she's now here. And that's because about two years ago, I said, why don't we ask her? And they said, but remember, she has said no to us. And I said, who knows, maybe she's divorced. And uh, she came, so when I saw her after she'd arrived, I said, you know, I made this little joke about you and said maybe you were divorced and we should ask you again. And she said, that's exactly why I came, I'm now divorced. So I think that we should know this, that we can't take no for an answer, and that Harvard is no longer the place where people drop everything, family, location, and just come to us because this is Harvard. That is not gonna happen. We're interested in two people in my own department. One will not leave friends. The other is a woman who has a husband who we would not wanna hire and she will not move unless uh, the university makes offers to both of them. So they're, they're not gonna be hireable. So we've got to become super creative in our thinking about, because we don't think we're hiring boxers or athletes, right? There are many amazing people out there. Um, and so we actually have to become far more creative than we've had to be in our past. So with that, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mer Merida. Thank you. And uh, so it's clear why Mazarin was invited here. And uh, I was thinking that, um, that uh, Judy might introduce me as the person who's, who has chaired more failed searches uh, than anyone else at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Uh, I'm afraid I might have that honor. Uh, and, uh, but t uh, in, in fairness to myself, I've been put as the chair of difficult searches. Uh, so uh, we, we um, my own experience at the school uh, begins with uh, my participation in our Committee for the Advancement of Women Faculty um, over many years, uh, trying to understand patterns of hiring and promotion among uh, women faculty and also faculty of color at the school. 
Uh, and uh, we have some fabulous biostatisticians and epidemiologists on the committee. And so, of course, it was a very data-rich exercise. And you know, I want to pick up on, on some of the manifestations of, um, of what Mazarin was talking about to say first that when we look at our data and we ask the question of why we haven't increased gender equity over the last decade among the faculty at the School of Public Health, despite the fact that 75% of our students, 70% of our postdocs are women, uh, it looks like uh, women are just not applying for our jobs. That is our most critical uh, problem, is between postdoctoral studies and applying for our assistant professor jobs. And, uh, and so I, I've become very interested in these questions uh, around framing the job description and also uh, finding more effective ways to reach out to candidates who might not think that Harvard is a place for them, who might not see themselves here uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And uh, I, I'm sure it's, it's obvious to everyone that just putting your posting on lists that appeal to different kinds of groups is not actually going to increase uh, the rate of applications from those groups. Uh, you know, we do that to a large extent, but we really need warm networks and, um, and to find ways to uh, be more connected to sources of talent that are, don't look like us and haven't trained in exactly the same places where we have trained. Uh, in terms of the, the search process, uh, itself, uh, our, my experience has been that, um, that search committees really depend very heavily on an active chair. And uh, you know, I, I think <clears throat> to the extent that we could, and I think we are moving forward uh, with some consciousness raising um, in search committees. Uh, we're piloting some implicit bias training for search committees as they gather for a particular search um, to try to get people to start thinking about this. But then I think you need an active chair to continue to push the discussion, make sure that everyone gets discussed uh, and everyone gets heard. and um, and. There, there are certainly cases uh, when you know there may be one very senior faculty member on the search uh, that takes the d discussion in a particular way that closes off discussion of certain candidates, uh, and and I think some some active uh, monitoring of those conversations could really help there. I'm I'm very intrigued. I have been pulling out my hair thinking about how one can do blind reviews. Uh, but I am very intrigued about a multi-stage notion where there is at least some blind review uh, of something. It could be a paper, uh, for example. And um, you know, many of our fields are quite narrow, which can make that challenging, particularly for senior searches. But at the junior level, it ought to be possible mm -hmm. to get some objective uh, measure of, uh, of the science uh, for these individuals, maybe corresponding a little bit, Iris, to what you were talking about in terms of um, what you might do <coughs> with employees. Uh, so, you know, o overall, I think we um, we have made um, incremental steps in uh, in trying to make sure the the. Um, that we're not defining our searches too narrowly, which is another way in which we end up getting uh, the, sort of the self-reinforcing distribution of talent at the school. I, I think that's another place where um, taking a broad look uh, is really important. I, th I think the other thing that's important on the senior searches, since um, you, you were focusing there as well, uh, is uh, I have noticed that uh, it's very hard for uh, for people to focus on um, trying to gauge what this person will do at the school and the university for the next 20 years versus you know exactly where people have been. And, and I think uh, when we bring senior faculty here, we're really trying to project uh, as much as you know. Did that person work in this esteemed person's lab during their training? Um, have they uh, accomplished X in a certain number of years? And um, I sometimes I think trying to do do more to think about what that person in the Harvard context with a new set of colleagues uh, brings to the total environment uh, would be a useful way of of again diversifying because otherwise I think we judge people on 
on our own science and what we're already doing um, as opposed to what they bring to, uh, to growth for our units and our schools. So thank you very much. James. Thank you. It's surely the commonest introduction to an academic talk to say, I'm here to learn. <laughs> but um, very often it's not really meant. But I say it and I mean it. I'm here to learn. I've already learned things. In general, I think we have a really terrific set of practices for searches, so much superior to my experience in the United Kingdom. Um, but one aspect of their strength is precisely the, our readiness to scrutinize those practices in the way that we're doing right now. They're always improvable. Now, I'll say it right out at risk of being um, branded as a heretic. I personally do not conduct searches in order to produce, in order to produce a more diverse faculty. That for me is not an end in itself. I conduct searches so as to produce the best faculty. But before you um, excommunicate me, let me say that our gender statistics about ratios coming out of P PhD programs and minority statistics um, just point to the fact that we should be ending up with a much greater diversity in our faculty. So in order to produce the best faculty, we have to produce a more diverse faculty. I'll be talking about tenure track searches. Um, I did ch uh, check the invitation just now in, after oh, Mazarin said we were talking about senior no, searches. It's not. It does not say that. So, right, sorry about that. Um, but I think everything we're saying about tenure track searches does apply, or just about. So we're putting a huge effort into our tenure track searches right now. Um, Judy said that it should be like your first child. Um, I hope that tenure track searches don't keep us awake as much as our first child. But apart from that, yes, the same level of care and joy in this search and, and welcome to a tenure track colleague. Um, we're putting a huge effort into those searches now, given the new ethos in the college of tenuring from within. When I arrived in Harvard in 2003, it was assumed that tenure was not really going to happen. Um, but now it can happen, it does happen. And so we really take seriously this criterion of tenurable within seven years as we hire higher tenure track faculty. And that means much, much higher standards of search as we hire. Our uh, gender and minority ratios are relatively weak. They're getting a bit stronger for gender, but got some way to go for diversity. So we're really, really listening very hard to people of the kind we're hearing today, and particularly Mazarin, if I may say so. We are explicitly citing Mazarin Banerjee in many of our discussions about searches. I think the information you're feeding into the system is just tremendous. We don't have a standard search process precisely because, thanks to Mazarin, it's being updated all the time. But that said, I'm going to take you through our current search process for tenure track uh, and ask if you agree with them. But there is one principle that guides everything we do, uh, and that is avoid groupthink by putting arithmetic before rhetoric. Avoid groupthink by putting arithmetic before rhetoric. Particularly important in an English department. I'm going to be citing you, mister. <laughs> so what are the initial steps? We make a representative search committee. We have a broad definition of the field. We write to colleagues in the field all over the country, other countries. Um, this, I can talk about why we do that, but we do. Um, establishment of a long shortlist. Now this is where I want to ask for the legal advice. We separate, we got this idea from philosophy, we separate the applications. We've agreed to do this uh, on gender lines. We read the women applicants first. We select the 10 or 12 best women and thereby we get our eye in for the standards that we're going to apply the kinds of things we're looking for in this search. We establish the kind of benchmarks of the search 
on the basis of those 10 or 12 best women applications. And then we read the men. And only then do we establish a short list. Once we've established the, uh, the, 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 uh, those gendered readings, once we've established our short list, we split the applications into as many people as are on the uh, search committee, and then we split it again so that we each read, uh, every application is read twice. Um, if minority applications can be identified securely, then we reach, we each read every minority application. That's a big if. I don't know personally, this is another big hole in my knowledge, if minority applications can be identified securely. And I will not guess. Arithmetic. For all readings, we establish a numerical tally in the first instance. Uh, we give a certain proportion to quality of letters, to the cover letter, certain proportion of the cover letter, the teaching research statements, certain proportion the, to the quantity and outlets of publications. Uh, we give our largest uh, numerical uh, category to the research, research sample, and then we just give um, a certain number of points for potential for growth in research and or teaching contribution. Where might this person go? Now, we come to the first meeting with a tally of each of our readings, and we share the tally, we do the arithmetic, before we treat the, dis the applications discursively. We do not let one English professor say, this was so dazzling. <laughs> we just don't allow any of that stuff any of the rhetoric to capture spirits, to ca cow spirits perhaps. Um, we just do numbers. Um, so at this point, we've done, we introduced another novelty. When we get to our short, short list, we bring graduates in, two graduates in. We strip out the letters so the graduates are not reading individual letters, personal letters. Uh, and the graduates will read the theses that we receive and help us with the construction of the long list. Um, MLA interviews, our practice has been completely changed by um, Mazarin and uh, I think Iris as well gave a paper at the faculty club. Um, many problems with interviews. Apparently, if there to be more than one on one, research shows that four interviewers are the optimum number. Have I got that right? Mm -hmm. So interviews should be structured, as we've heard. We're, we're structuring them. Um, the committee asks the same X number of questions. And each committee member will score arithmetically each candidate on each question. Um, avoid all chat. Chat is prohibited after rhetoric, after every interview, after just anything outside formal mechanisms, chat is disallowed. Um, when we come to a formal meeting, we collect the numbers prior to discussion. You know, I call in the numbers and I do the arithmetic and I present the arithmetic on the spot. No one can change their numbers. And they go, oh, someone's given more, I should perhaps fiddle with that. No, no arithmetical fiddling. So once again, arithmetic before rhetoric, um, campus chair, campus visits. Um, something we've introduced recently is a lunchtime teaching event. In the past, we would take the candidate to the faculty club with a group of senior faculty. My stomach is still in a knot when I think of the the tone of these horrible lunches. You know, just just learn nothing. You're very often a long way from the candidate. Uh, just total waste of time and money. What we do now is we get the, uh, each candidate to give a teaching demonstration. They talk for 20 minutes and then we, uh, we, we, we open a conversation. We have all the graduates there, very big audience, all the faculty. Um, that, that's videoed and then we take them to dinner, obviously. Um, and then the committee meets to recommend it, make its recommendations and the department 
has uh, a vote. I suddenly realized as I was um, preparing these comments that we don't put arithmetic before rhetoric <laughs> when it comes to the departmental vote. And maybe it would be a good idea if we did do that before we had the departmental meeting. Everyone just sends in a number. Um, so I think I've taught myself something. I'm done. Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists um, for being here today. Thank you, Mazarin. Thank you, Mazarin. And again, thank you to Judy and her office for um, her leadership on this topic and for putting this together. Judy, back to you. Can I say before Judy gets on that I just think we've been improving and I, I would have made an ideal, I would have made a list of how you ideally run a search and James basically said that's what they're doing. That's astonishing to me and for that I'm really pleased. Okay. Thank you. And, and any English chair that says arithmetic before rhetoric, I, know, I, know. I, I think that line will, will get repeated. I, I this just is why want we need an English professor. And Mazarin and Meredith and James for their leadership in, in this, these efforts. This is a lot of work. Um, the amount of energy that we put into faculty searches, and a lot of this spills off into graduate admissions. Uh, to Rahid's question about the pipeline, if we can take some of these ideas and put them in our admissions committees, I think we might have a somewhat more diverse pipeline, admittedly 10 years from now, but that's, that's where we have to make change. Um, I would also issue an open invitation. Uh, I am happy, and Elizabeth Ancarona, Elizabeth, you want to raise your hand, assistant provost for faculty development university. We are happy to meet with any search committee. We're happy to meet with any faculty member uh, who is interested in thinking about creative ways of doing this work. It is hard and we want to be supporting you uh, in these efforts. And if you have some good ideas or some questions, uh, please come see us. So thank you all very much for taking the time.